Welcome back to What Would It Cost? Today we have a very special guest, Marissa Kokoris, the founder and director of Aura Freedom. Big shout out to Matty Camps from Sultavolo. He's got the best mozzarella, the best burrata. He's the sponsor for today's show. And uh, he even came behind the scenes and blessed us with some homemade paninos and uh, lots and lots of his product to keep the cast and the production crew well fed, well on set. But you got to check him out on Instagram at Sultavolo. And he's an absolute beauty and, and loves what he does. So support your local business and thank you again matt <laughs> what is it gonna cost how much hi my name is nicholas regina my name is michael sakuro and you're listening to what, what would it, it cost, cost? <laughs> is that good thank you very much marissa for coming yeah, out thanks for yeah. having me thank yeah, you no problem yeah we were excited to have you out, especially in light of our golf tournament as uh, aura freedom is our community initiative yes and uh, yeah, we'd love to talk about uh, a bit about yourself and how you came to be in founding Aura Freedom and what Aura Freedom is all about. Yeah, again, thank you. It's cool to have a, a nonprofit lens and perspective on the show. And I know normally um, I'm an unlikely guest to be to have here. So I think it's really progressive of you guys and cool. So thank you for having me. Yeah, thank you. Aura Freedom is about eight years old now. We are a registered Canadian charity and we're a grassroots women-led organization that works to eradicate violence against women and children and child and youth trafficking here in Toronto and more broadly and widely in Canada. We also have some international projects as well. So yeah, we're about eight years old, but as many entrepreneurs know the the first few years are really slow going and a um, lot of hard work that is of course unpaid and volunteer but yeah so how I started is another I think unlikely story is how I started my background is not uh, was not in human rights or in social work um, by trade I'm actually a copywriter I'm a writer um, but I did a lot of traveling and I spent time in different countries I lived in Europe for a long time, uh, just over six years. And while I was living there, I spent time in different countries in Europe uh, and in African countries, in South Asian countries, um, researching and doing grassroots community work with women's organizations and um, really doing grassroots research and community research on human trafficking and how it happened. And um, it was uh, just a, a, a calling I had. Um, I couldn't ignore it. I always felt, you know, a strong sense of justice towards women's rights, and um, I've always been, you know, a women's rights activist. But I was especially intrigued by sex trafficking and exploitation, and kind of figuring out how these things were happening. Because while I was living in Italy, I befriended some survivors who were trafficked from Nigeria to Milano, and um, they told me their story. And I ended up supporting them in Italy and trying to work with the police and immigration. Um, they were framed for things they didn't do. They were criminalized um, just for being exploited. They were trafficked from Nigeria to Milano for sex work under the guise of a better life, jobs in like clothing stores or as cleaners and things like that. Um, and then instead were exploited on the street um, as teenagers. So that's what started my uh, work. And then I started just doing field work in in different countries and just sat on the floor with women in different countries and me as a woman um and you know having some familial experience as well um with uh, violence against women and and having many of us that do this work have our own story so i just couldn't get away from it and then six years later i moved back to canada and started aura freedom so it, it was it was long before aura freedom was created yeah. that you were involved in a way yeah. that uh you know uh was was taking on a lot of time yeah. and and you really devoted yourself to um so that that's awesome to know that there's that many years of experience behind it and now that you guys have been open and operating and and kicking butt and, and trying to fight what you guys are fighting and doing a great job at it for eight years, right? Yeah, so, awesome, yeah, there was a awesome. lot of legwork. So, so so much of that time, I was living and working in Italy. I would work, I was a teacher, and so I was working, I would get some money and go to another country and then come back, get more money and go to another country. And I ended up making friends with, you know, human rights defenders and women's rights advocates in India and Nepal. I spent a lot of time in Nepal yeah. um, mm. and um, worked with women who've been doing this way longer than me and I always want to recognize them and you know uh, like as mentors to me that that have been doing this work for for decades 
And yeah, so it started way before Aura Freedom was official, like the official yeah. incorporating as a nonprofit and then working with a lawyer to get registered as a Canadian charity, which is very hard to do for anyone that's ever done it in Canada. Um, it was very hard to get registered as a charity. Um, you go, you've got to jump through a lot of hoops and loops, but we did it. And so we started um, working with Global Affairs Canada. My first grant was from Global Affairs Canada to do work in Nepal, led by local Nepali women. And I spent a lot of time in South Asia. Um, and then when I had my own daughter here, I started focusing my work on Canadian trafficking that happens right here. So child and youth trafficking is not um, exclusive to international. It's a Canadian issue. Right. It happens here. Right, right. Yeah. And, yeah. The, and, and so taking that experience from um, you learning in, in Europe yeah, and, and exactly. really applying yourself and, and then being able to, to fight it in your own backyard, right? Exactly, so exactly, very cool. exactly. Yeah, uh, yeah, in, yeah. in my hometown of Toronto, this is where I was born, you know. Yeah. Um, and so I joined different coalitions. I wanted to learn more um, because a, a lot of my experience was international and was in, uh, again, South Asia or in Italy. So I started to learn more. I joined the Toronto Counter Human Trafficking Network and I started working with survivors here. I dedicated everything, basically. Or Freedom was is like my second baby after mm -hmm. my daughter, Joya, so. Yeah, yeah. awesome. That's awesome. And I want to talk a bit about the business aspect, because we were talking about it a bit yeah. before. You know, yeah. you are non-for-profit, you are yeah. a charity, but what a lot of people don't realize is that you still also are an entre entrepreneur at heart. Of course. And uh, an entrepreneur every day, because it is a business that you're running. There's still a lot of yeah. fees associated, a team. Yeah. And like you just said right from the beginning, you had a lawyer that had to help you out. Yeah. To, you know, to become a charity. So yeah. it's like the irony right there, right off yeah. the bat, you're putting in, again, volunteered hours and money to create this this organization. So run us through a bit about mm -hmm. what the day-to-day -day looks like in terms of running this business as a charity. Yeah, great question. Yeah, thank you. It's it, The beginning was all me. And it's still, in, in the grand scheme of things, a lot of um, people who run grassroots organizations know that the, the founder and director really is... Um, in many ways, the core, we kind of like the mom of, yeah. of the group, we keep things together. But in the beginning, it was just me. Um, and so everything from registering to getting a board, uh, each charity has to have a board of directors and they um, make decisions for charities. Charities are different than for-profit businesses. We work with perhaps government funding. We work with public funding and donations from you know everyday Canadians. So we have to be accountable to them yeah. uh, and so there's a lot of reporting that goes into when we get a donation or a grant there's a lot of reporting that we have uh, to show what the project accomplished before any of that there's a budget for a project so we put a budget together and we talk about what staff we're going to need mm -hmm. um, what uh, resources or supplies we're going to need for the project what spaces we need for the project um, transportation, we put together a budget and we go to a donor. Hmm. That donor might be a um, private donor, might be a corporate donor, or it might be a government donor, provincial, regional, federal governments, they all have pockets of money and funding that they give to different programs. Mm -hmm. So you put it together your budget and a grant proposal. And those are, that's huge work. Um, anyone who's watching this that knows um, what it's like to write a grant proposal for in the nonprofit world. We, we joke that, you know, they want your firstborn son. Like, they want everything from you. And mm. then when they give you the money, they want to um, yeah. you to report back on it as well, mm -hmm. really intricately. So, mm. um, yeah, and then you, it takes years to gain trust um, in the, you know, gender-based violence sector in the human trafficking world, the anti-human trafficking world, you don't just start and say, you know, I want to end child trafficking. You have to understand the way it happens. You know, it doesn't happen like in the movies, you know, like that movie Taken. You're not abducted by someone you don't know. Trafficking happens, um, usually 98% of the cases are people you do know um, who are exploiting you in a very slow manipulative process there's a luring and grooming stage um most often it's um people posing as boyfriends to young girls or friends sometimes unfortunately it's family members um due to you know intergenerational trauma poverty and violence and you know the marginalization of different uh, groups of people um 
indigenous youth and black youth and racialized youth or LGBTQ youth who don't have a support system at home or by society supporting them. So they have vulnerabilities that exploiters prey upon, right? right? And that's the first step is human trafficking happens in the same way every time. The first step is targeting someone to exploit, right? And it's really hard to exploit an empowered person that knows their worth. The trafficker will move on to someone else that they can actually target, right? So we work, that's why we work on youth empowerment and advancing equality and all those things. That's why we work on, you know, empowering youth um, and building youth up to know their worth, know they're important, get s support systems around them. We work to advance equality in those things um, because the first step is always targeting someone to exploit. So uh, a trafficker will look at to find the crack in the surface of the victim right whatever that is if they um, are experiencing a bad time at home if they have you know abuse in their past if they're part of the child welfare or foster system if they are just a young girl who doesn't like the way she looks and society tells her she needs to look a certain way if they're an indigenous youth who doesn't have um, the support systems in place and systemic racism whatever it is they're going to get in through there and they're going to exploit that vulnerability and get in through that crack. And then they fill a need. The, the second step, it's textbook. It's literally a textbook. Every trafficker uses the same steps. Uh, when you fill a need, you do they need to feel loved? Do they need to feel accepted? Do they need to be told that they're the most beautiful girl in the world? Now I'm believing everything you're telling me that I've always wanted to hear. Or, you know, I have a shitty family at home who's mistreating me and you're giving me love and you're giving me everything that I always needed. Um, and this is the love bombing stage, the honeymoon stage. I'm taking you away for the weekend. I'm buying you everything. Uh, you're getting your nails done. You're getting your hair done. You're getting trips away for the weekend. I'm promising you a house with the white picket fence and a perfect family that perhaps you've never had. Um, and that is the, I've worked with young girls who've told me, Marissa, I'm, you know, 40 years old now, and I've still never felt the love I felt in the love bombing stage. I'm, you know, and so the survivor is always trying to get back to that right. point and be in the, the trafficker's um, good books. Then after that beautiful phase of uh, love, let's say it's not real love, um, there is the isolation. So during that, that stage, I want to say, they're gaining information and trust from you. So I know where your little brother plays after school now, because I find out everything about you. I know where your parents live. I know what you don't like about yourself. I might ask you to send me nudes. So online youth exploitation is huge. And this is a gateway to sex trafficking because young people who are being groomed online, um, and it's almost always online now, you know, it still happens at the mall, it can happen at Wonderland, you know, it can happen at, at the bus stop, but a lot of uh, youth trafficking and child trafficking starts online now, and that was exacerbated by COVID. So yeah, and then um, I'm gonna gain information that I'm gonna use later to threaten you and keep you right where I need to keep you, right? right. Then I isolate my victim, I'm gonna isolate you, tell you, I might, maybe you do have parents because it's not, always you know the homeless youth who's being exploited sometimes i've worked with girls that come from you know affluent neighborhoods who were you know and have like a family unit that were exploited um maybe i'm going to take the little things that you're complaining about your parents i'm going to blow them up right i'm going to you know do those types of things i'm going to isolate you from your family and friends and anyone who could give a damn about you i'm going to vilify them and and it's coercive control it's psychological manip manipulation that's how trafficking happens not throwing a young girl in a van and driving her across you know the border it, it right. doesn't happen that way and that's why it's hard to recognize human trafficking mm. and that's why it's important the training and those things um we can go through the other steps but i think um it's important to just kind of know that human trafficking is not what you see in the movies it's a human rights abuse that flourishes in situations where there's an empower, uh, uh, imbalance of power, inequality, and, and those types of situations. That's where human trafficking thrives. And um, so training is super important. We've done con consulting and training for social workers, the police, um, 
I'm working with the Toronto District School Board right now, helping them create from the bottom up their anti-sex trafficking plan for the entire Toronto District School Board. Oh, wow. Um, we've done consulting at the municipal, provincial, and federal levels of gov government for strategies to put in place to address trafficking in Canada. Um, you know, we yeah, we, we do so much, but um, I think... I, I got off because luring and grooming, I have a passion to talk about, especially parents and, and educators and frontline workers to know and be able to realize that maybe it's not your youth acting out or being promiscuous. Perhaps they are facing online grooming. Perhaps right. they're being exploited and to recognize these mm. things and intervene in an appropriate way. That's awesome information for all the the audience listening in and or, or watching in so what are some of those ways that they could become more aware that this may be happening underneath underneath their very roof yeah, uh, and yeah. what they could do to avoid that um and any little bit of information that you feel that you'd want to give the audience to to be able to understand how to help you fight the fight right? yeah. yeah yeah or a freedom and we're not the only organization that does this work there are different anti-trafficking organizations out there uh, in toronto gta canada that do this work um so get, you know get informed and getting the knowledge about what human trafficking af actually looks like is super important and last year we launched um the human trafficking info hub so we launched this i think maybe nine months we had it all come together but it was the culmination of 10 years of experience with working with survivors we had consultants our um, indigenous colleagues our social workers child and youth welfare workers we had frontline workers come and consult and um, based on all of our grassroots sweat and tears we launched our human trafficking info hub that you can find on orafreedom.org and it's a online resource um, really easy to navigate with an index that gives you information on what domestic sex trafficking actually looks like in Canada and what youth, uh, you know, need to look out for, what parents should look out for. Mm -hmm. There's stuff on internet safety and healthy relationships, you know. The root causes of trafficking, you know, aren't what we think they are. Yes, it's a crime. Sometimes there's organized crime involved and our work can be dangerous and things like that. But really, at the end of the day, the root causes of trafficking are... Um, you know inequalities that that youth are facing right. right and there's no protective factors perhaps in place maybe i never knew what a healthy relationship looked like and so this really unhealthy and toxic and traumatic relationship that i now have with this person who is a trafficker but posing as my boyfriend seems normal to me right, right? Mm -hmm. maybe i don't know what consent is and you know i've worked with youth that told me marissa i never said no but they didn't realize that coercion is not consent. They weren't given the space to say no. They weren't able to say no. And people ask the, the questions like, why don't they just leave? Because they're not chained to beds, no. Because when, after the isolation period and the exploitation begins and they are sold for sex online, um, in Airbnbs, in hotel rooms, um, whatever the case is, the the door is wide open for them to leave right but the chains are up here mm. the chains are you know they they are, first of all they know everything about your family okay so they're going to go after everyone i love i've been criminalized perhaps i've been asked to carry guns or arm uh you know guns or drugs for my trafficker and i've been booked for that they're, they're so it's very complex right yeah, so it's hard to um it's, say it's, why didn't you just leave like and i'm 16 years old yeah. or 17 right. years old yeah the programs and the steps that they have in place have a level of sophistication towards them that it doesn't have it being like the way Hollywood shining the no. light on it. It, it, no. it. Again, it's very no. sophisticated. It's methodical. It's yeah. thought out. And you don't even know or realize that it's happening. And it is. And that's how good they are. Yeah. It, which is scary. Yeah. They know, scary, yeah. I mean, <clears throat> how bad it is because, you know, the trauma that survivors experience when they come out of those situations is similar to soldiers coming back from combat. Right. Like that, that the trauma of human trafficking survivors can be compar compared to that. And I've seen that. But they don't realize what is happening because the steps are so, um, they happen in a very, yes, methodical way. It's very mm. smooth and, um, yeah, it's, it's all set up. So uh, I think knowing, you know, we can say the same about domestic violence. Why doesn't she just leave? Instead of saying that, why don't we say, what are the barriers preventing them from getting out? What are the barriers that, 
youth have in front of them that are preventing them from leaving a trafficker or an exploiter. Um, the barriers are fear, fear of what's going to happen to me when I leave. What is society going to accept me again after being involved with something like this because sex work is stigmatized? Um, you know, gender-based violence is stigmatized. Fear of who's going to love me now? You know, right. how is my family going to accept me back? How am I going to put food on the table? Because, you know, at the end of the day, this person was exploiting them, but they maybe got to eat sometimes and they had a roof over their head. What if I have nothing to go back to? You know, so there's a, a, a lot of fear. And then there's the course of control, which is like the traffickers favorite. It's a cornerstone of trafficking. Um, and there's a whole we have a whole thing on our info hub. What is course of control? We have a slideshow about it. You can click through. You can find it on our Instagram, too. Um, very methodical. And it's all you know, this is all planned. Hmm. This is all planned. Interesting. Yeah. yeah. So what what could what could the audience, what could the viewers, what could the listeners do? to help to help you fight and and a big reason why um we wanted to get behind your non-for-profit charity is mm -hmm. because we knew that you roll up the sleeves yeah. and you lace up the boots and you get on the battlefield yourself and that there's not layers and layers and layers and layers of management and you know um you don't really know where where the uh the, the money is going that you're allocating towards a charity and and, and we really believe in you we really believe in your vision. We believe in your efforts. We believe in your passion that is driven you to fight the fight as, as, as well as you are. So tell us a bit more about how they can help yeah. and, and what they could do on their end to really empower you and how that starts to look from a, from a business standpoint yeah. because that's essentially tying back into the point you spoke Absolutely. about earlier is what you're doing as well as, as, as fighting the fight on, on the floor as you're running a business on the background. Mm -hmm. How does that start to work in regards to allocating budget Budgets and how does that look like in regards to your your level of effectiveness when when on the battlefield? Right? Yeah. So again, thank you for the opportunity. And yeah. I I don't do this alone. I have a team. I want to give them a shout out. We're a small team. There are four employees, um, and then we have a board of directors. We have volunteers and advisors. Shout out, to, shout yeah. out those four soldiers, man. That's, yeah. that's hard work that you guys are doing day in day out, and uh, we're gonna do our best to get behind. You Olivia, as well. yeah, Tashin, yeah. Orla. I also want to give a shout out to Asha Dahir, um, and all of our board of directors as well, and our 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 um, yeah, yeah, yeah our right our now. crew. Um, so again, yeah, how can, how can people support? I think in terms of as a general topic, <clears throat> it's really easy for people to say, you know, in terms of violence against women. Well, I do my best. I don't you know, um, per perpetuate violence. I'm not a violent person. I respect the women in, in my life. Like, you know, I'm so, th this is horrible, but it's, it's, I can't, it's too much for me, right? Mm -hmm. This is a, one of the reasons why societal issues continue because it's everyone's issue, right? And many of us have kids and they're growing up, right? And all kids, all youth are at risk of exploitation in some way, especially if they have a phone. Um, and especially in, in the world that we live in. So knowing and knowledge sharing is very important. Getting educated on what these issues are. You don't have to become an expert. You don't have to march on the front lines with us. You might want to pick up a sign one day and you know join a march for you know violence against women or the anti-trafficking or the Every Child Matters Indigenous Children. That might be something you want to do or you just want to um, donate your time or if you ha you're an organization or a business you have funding you want to donate funding those those things always help grassroots groups are underfunded and overworked underpaid historically and still now um, and we're doing really um we work hard burnout is a real deal in our in the you know violence against women sector so we have a four-day work week i want to say that or freedom in 2020 made the decision to have a four-day work week our staff only works four days a week to give them an extra three days to this is heavy work right, right? Mm -hmm. so um and if we're not okay then we can't do the the important work um so anyway back to back to what people can do is get informed share what you learn this is how change happens. You think it, it doesn't matter. The ripple effects 
matter. Right. Mm. This podcast and someone watching it and learning about it um, and saying, I didn't even know, you know, I heard before, I didn't even know trafficking happened in, in Canada. Yeah. And now you're passing that information right. on. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but Very yeah, cool. yeah, the trickle supporting, effect. Yeah, the really, ripple yeah. effect mm -hmm. and, and yeah. being being interested in things that are hard to talk about. Because I know, I mean, sometimes I just want to put on um, RuPaul or Bridgerton and turn off the world because that's what makes me feel better and we need the, you know, the cocoon of care. But we can't, ignorance is not bliss. Right. Right, and until it happens to you or someone you know, it's really hard to to, to em, you know be empathetic. Yeah, but we have to, we have to. Yeah, yeah. So going going into the the business aspect for someone that's interested in starting their own foundation or even joining your foundation, what's that day to day of the business look like? You mentioned you have employees yeah. and a board of directors. So yeah. again, very much so, just like any other business. Yeah. So yeah. So just bring us into some detail behind what that looks like. Yeah. So when we started, we we had to incorporate. So first, you don't just start a charity. You incorporate as a nonprofit first. Mm -hmm. Uh, you can incorporate provincially or federally. We made the decision back then to incorporate federally, which would open up, you know, opportunities for federal funding. And there's other things um, that it's just it, 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 it suited us better. Right. Our work, we wanted to be, you know, Canada wide. So there's those decisions. If you want to be able to bring in more money, the truth of the matter is charities will all most of the time bring in more money than nonprofits because they're able to give that tax receipt. So mm -hmm. you, you can get those corporate donations right from businesses, a business that supports us, who has long supported us for a long time is Lush. So Lush, the cosmetic company, mm -hmm. um, they they have supported our anti-trafficking work for like three years in a row now or four years, probably. Um, and, you know, you are able to. Um, not that they ask us, you know, not that they do that for the receipt, but you're able to offer corporations as a charity, a partnership that kind of differs then from a nonprofit. So you make the decision whether you want to become a registered charity. And we made that decision and we went through that work, at, which was a lot. <laughs> it was a lot of work, but it was worth it. We also can receive money from directly from governments. So government funding comes directly to us. If you're a nonprofit, and you're not registered as a charity, you have to work with a charity and have these things like agency agreements. Right. So things like this, so much more paperwork, accounting becomes um, you know, a pain. So, but it looks like a for-profit business in the sense that we have a board of directors um, who make decisions on you know, finances and, and kind of higher level decisions. Then you have management in our organization, we're small, um, so our management is, like we all do everything. You know, in grassroots organizations, like I empty the garbage in the office. I'm not like, you know, the executive producer, the Wizard of Oz behind the curtain. <laughs> I'm so important, I can't do that work, right. right? So we all do everything, but normally there's kind of management and then you have people who carry out your projects. Right. Right. You have project managers. Do you have a trauma counselor on hand who who is it depends on what your your charity or your nonprofit does. And then you write grants with budgets. When you get funding, you carry out that project exactly the way you said you were going to do it. If there's leeway, you know, sometimes when you put a project budget together, you think it's going to look one way. And when you're actually carrying out the project, you realize I need Uber credits to move girls to a safe space mm -hmm. right now. And I realized that I needed way more money in travel. So you kind of really, as the years go, you know exactly what you need for, for mm -hmm. a project. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, and then you report back, you get audited just like a business does. Um, you have to report back on your charitable activities and your financial activities every year. Um, so you need accounting, good accountants. Yeah. You need great accountants that can really help you. Um, most grassroots, you know, social activists are not like we don't. I hate accounting. Like I hate accounting, right. right? So it's hard. So you need to work with people that that have those. And if you have those people on your board, which we do, that's even better. Right. Yeah. You want to put people on your board who will make the charity accountable to the work, to the finances, but also you need like. I need activists on my board. I need survivors on, on our board of advisors, you know. Um, yeah, you put together your uh, family. Yeah, and then right. it just starts going. That's it awesome. just starts to, yeah, 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 to awesome. go. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. 
I think if, if you're, you're doing if you're the right thing, yeah, yeah, if you're yeah, doing yeah, the yeah. right thing, sometimes so I, I don't want to yeah. say that and then someone's watch, watching and they say shit, it didn't happen for me. But most of the time, you yeah, know, yeah, it, no, it, for sure. Yeah. You could tell the way if your heart's it's, there. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. It's going to go. Yeah, absolutely. The heart and the effort combined together, nothing can get in your way. Yeah. Sure. Yeah, yeah. 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 So let everybody know uh, where they could uh, find Aura Freedom and as well as, uh, yeah, how they could support and uh, who to contact. Please check us out. AuraFreedom.org. Aura, A U R A, freedom.org. Um, you can access our human trafficking info hub, which is a free resource for parents, educators, frontline workers. On Instagram, we're at Aura Freedom. It was really cool to kind of have a different audience because a lot of the time we speak to ourselves, other people doing this right. work. So it's nice to kind of get a, a different audience today. Awesome. Thanks. That was great. Yeah. All ears on that one. Uh, and guys, please check them out on our freedom. What they're doing is, is totally awesome. And it's happening right here in our own backyard. So it's very important that we all get involved in this and, and put a solid effort and take a few minutes out of our day to do that. Uh, yeah. And, and big shout out to Maddie Cheese. We love that Sutavolo touch here on uh, behind the scenes on the podcast, bringing in those awesome homemade go sandwiches. Right now. Yeah. Yeah. They're <laughs> great. And uh, keeping our bellies full and us, uh, level-headed while we're, while we're hosting our, our guests and having a good time. Everything burrata, mozzarella, they're the experts. Location, brick-and-mortar location coming very soon. Well, thanks again for tuning into this week's episode. Be sure to like, follow, and share, and we'll see you next week. Next on What Would It Cost? My parents have been in real estate for 30-something years. A uh, little boutique team up in Keswick, Ontario, north end of the GTA. Uh, a lot of people say it's not in the GTA, but I like to, to say that or reiterate that it is. I don't I don't t uh, decide the geography, but according to Wikipedia, it is in the Greater Toronto Area. He puts the realist in real yeah, estate. Yeah, eh? yeah. Sorry, guys. <laughs> well, it's like you know, I I'll, like post a listing, and it's like this is in the Greater Toronto Area, and you get like a bunch of Karens on Facebook because you use like a Facebook ads, right? And the Karens are like, this isn't in the Greater Toronto Area, and I'm like, no, it is. I post the Wikipedia like, sorry, the map, right? Sorry, it is. Like I don't, I, I didn't make the rules.